Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is a 2003 role-playing game developed by Bioware, a studio known for the excellent action-adventure puzzle platformer MDK2, a series revolving around the Baldur Gate and something about Mass Effects, I think. KOTOR needs no introduction. It took the world by storm in 2003 and ensured a cozy spot in many a best games ever made lists. Critics and gamers alike showered KOTOR with praise, lauding its novel spin on the Star Wars canon, deep RPG systems and writing. To many, KOTOR was the breath of fresh air that the Star Wars franchise desperately needed after the mediocre Phantom Menace and absolutely atrocious Attack of the Clones. But to a 10 year old me whose family didn't have enough money for that fancy official Star Wars merchandise and resorted to mashing his toys against each other and pretending they're Jedi, KOTOR was a game that let me go pew pew and vroom vroom, which was which was pretty cool. Yeah, a lot of the game went over my head in 2003. Half the time I had no idea what the characters were yapping about and the story was this nebulous entity that distracted me from what I was actually there for. Going vroom vroom with my lightsaber. So here I am as an adult replaying this game nearly 20 years after the first time I had played it. And it's pretty great. KOTOR is not a masterfully written meta deconstruction that its sequel was, but it's pretty good nonetheless. So before jumping into the video, let's go through some house rules. First of all, I've used two fan patches to fix KOTOR's resolution in UI, which I'll link in the description. Be aware that applying these patches correctly is not as easy as it seems, so I recommend watching this video, also linked in the description. Secondly, you might have noticed that the in-game pointer looks a bit off, as if it's missing a texture. This glitch appears only in recordings, not in the game itself, so try not to be too alarmed by it. I couldn't for the life of me fix it, so I hope it's not too visually grating for those of you who prefer watching videos with your eyeballs instead of putting them in the background. No judgement to those who prefer listening to videos instead of actively watching them, by the way. It's, it's all cool by me. Now, as for the video itself, I've decided to stray away from my standard format and go for a more story-focused structure. This means that I will go through the entire story of KOTOR and address things like gameplay, visuals, some side quests, companions, characters, writing and so on as they appear. This is by no means an exhaustive in-depth analysis of KOTOR, I adopted this format to make things easier easier for me to write and edit. And I'm already screwing up. <laughs> also, spoilers. Lots of spoilers. An ungodly amount of spoilers. As for socials, I've got a Twitter, or whatever the hell it's called right now, and a Patreon where you can support my work with real life money. Let's go! So I'm not gonna spend too much time on character creation. If you're watching this, chances are you've already played KOTOR and you're here for the spoiler heavy story explanation. If you haven't, here's the gist. KOTOR is an RPG based on 3rd edition Dungeons and Dragons, with a few tweaks to run better as a video game. Players choose between 3 base classes, with each kinda sorta corresponding to a classic RPG archetype. Scoundrel, the equivalent of a stealth rogue class, the soldier, basically a warrior, and the scout. A jack of all trades type class that focuses more on skills. Choosing a class has you investing points into attributes. The D&D system means that having 8 or 9 points in an attribute gives you a negative 1 modifier, 10 or 11 translates into a flat 0, 12 and 13 gets you a plus 1 and so on. Because it had been a while since I last played KOTOR, I decided to roll with a bulky charismatic roguish type who knows his way around the vibroblade. By the way, I have very limited experience with D&D so try to be, you know, not too alarmed by my lackluster attribute point distribution. I've never been one to min-max his RPG characters and the game is pretty easy to begin with anyway. Beyond class, there's skills. With the knowledge that I'd rely on my companions to dish out most of the damage in the early game, I decided to focus on persuasion, demolitions, computer use for interfacing with security systems and security for lockpicking. Finally, you get to pick a feat, which mostly affects combat. There is a huge variety of feats both 
both active and passive. Passive feats come in the form of weapon focuses that grant certain bonuses. For example, choosing blaster rifle focus gets you plus one attack bonus with blaster rifles. Same goes for melee weapons and blaster pistols focus. There's also dueling and two-handed weapons focus. With dueling, characters who use one-handed weapons in combat gain plus one to attack and plus one to defense. The two-weapon fighting feat reduces the attack penalty derived from wielding double-bladed weapons or one weapon in each hand. Another interesting passive feat is toughness, which grants one extra vitality point every time the character levels up. The cool thing is that the bonus applies retroactively for levels previously gained. So if you find yourself lagging behind in terms of HP, you can activate this bad boy and you're good. And active feats are basically combat-oriented abilities. Being certain that my character would be melee combat focused, I went with flurry and toughness. Again, I know my build isn't exactly optimal or even good, but it doesn't really matter all that much. I beat this game at 10 by assigning skill points and feats at random and using the auto level up feature. It's 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 fine, trust me. So starting the game up brings you to a very familiar opening which could have made for an awesome intro for this video had the copyright goals lurking within the bowels of YouTube not blasted my test clip with claims. Anyways... The story takes place 4000 or so years before the formation of the Galactic Empire. Much like in the prequel trilogy, the Galactic Republic is marred by petty corruption and institutional decay after being weakened by a series of external threats. First were the Mandalorians, a warrior society who launched a devastating pan-galactic invasion of Republic-controlled space. The Jedi were hesitant to get involved until a pair of renegade Jedi Knights, Revan and Malak, joined the war effort as commanders against the Council's orders and turned the tide of the war. After winning the Mandalorian War, Revan and Malak fucked off to the Unknown Regions. A year later, they returned with a Sith Armada and launched their own invasion against the Republic. The Republic barely hanging on, like my voice here, the Republic, barely hanging on after the Mandalorian Wars, is now fighting a losing war against the Sith Armada, whose ranks are filled with former Republic officers and Jedi who have turned to the dark side. Sometime prior to the events of the game, Malak, now Revan's apprentice, succeeded his former master as Dark Lord after Revan was struck down by a Jedi strike force led by Bastila, an up-and-coming Jedi Padawan whose battle meditation ability is central to the Republic war effort. The game opens up on the Ender Spire, which is under attack by Malek's forces over the city world of Terrace. The player character is awakened from his beauty sleep by a loud crash and an agitated Tress Ulgo, who's like, Bastila is here, which is definitely why Malek has unleashed the entire force of the Sith Armada on our puny civilian ship. Uh, anyway, here's how the game works. You can move the mouse to the edges of the screen to rotate the camera. Alternately, moving the mouse while holding down the right mouse button will rotate the camera as well. You know, hearing the game's mechanics explained in such a non-diegetic fashion reminds me of a famous scene from The Wire, where a drug dealer, annoyed at the person who didn't understand the code words he used for cocaine over the phone, proceeded to blurt out the actual word to the amusement of a police officer who's like, when's the last time you heard cocaine on the phone? So, when's the last time you heard the game character saying, you can move the mouse in a game? Yeah, pretty funny. Anyways, after our little encounter with Trask, we're immediately introduced to the party system. The way this works is that you're gonna be swapping between your party members to use their various skill sets. Here, you're supposed to use Trask to hack this door, but since I'd already put a couple of points in security, I didn't need Trask's assistance. In addition to the party system, we're introduced to combat. The combat looks incredibly similar to an old-school isometric CRPG, where you target an enemy and use whatever skills you have at your disposal to take them down, be it abilities, grenades, and so on. I don't know why I use the word grenades there, but anyways. It might not be very obvious at first glance due to the 3D perspective, but the combat is actually turn-based. You even have a pause function that you can use at any time during combat to plan your next moves. Anyways, this combat system is incredibly dated and I can see a lot of new players bouncing for this reason. It's not that bad, I don't have a problem with it, though I might not be the perfect person to judge it since well, look at my portfolio, it's brimming with janky old games. Anyways, we kill some Sith, enter a new sector of the ship and Trask is like, holy fuck, a dark Jedi. I repeat, a dark Jedi and a light Jedi. Stay the fuck back, kid. This, this ain't for us.
Yeah, they both kicked the bucket. If only the Jedi was smart enough to get away from that obviously malfunctioning uh, wall. Ooh, would you look at that, we just gained our first level. So, as with any RPG, you earn experience points through questing and slaying enemies. You can auto-level up or do it manually, both for your characters and your companions. Depending on the level you've reached, the player character may earn an extra attribute point skill points, an extra feat, and later new Jedi powers. In this particular case I earned skill points and new feats. I dutifully invested my skill points in computer use and treat injury, and chose the melee weapons focus feat because, you know, I'm a sword boy. It's worth mentioning that cross-class skills cost more than your class-specific skills. So if I were, say, a soldier and chose to put some points into persuasion, it would've cost me more than for a class that comes with persuasion pre-baked like Scout in my case. Thankfully Persuasion becomes a class skill when you become a Jedi, so don't feel too bad if you choose Soldier as your starting class. Right past the Ender Spire's bridge, we stumble into another Dark Jedi, and Trask is like, holy fuck a Dark Jedi, I repeat, a Dark Jedi. Stay the fuck back kid, this ain't for you. Uh, I'ma go distract him while you go and escape with Bastila, bye. He then rushes the Dark Jedi and the door closes behind him, like, was this sacrifice really necessary? So we're all alone now, which is super convenient timing as right around the corner there's a whole squad of Sith officers stationed in a tight room. This dude called Karth tells us that we need to find some way to thin their numbers. Luckily for us, he stops just short of pulling a Trasky and a non diegetic tutorial by revealing two options to make our life easier. We can either hack the robot and turn it against the Sith if we have enough repair parts, or use computer spikes to slice into the terminal and turn the ship's security system against the Sith. I chose the latter because I kinda sorta like electrocuting people. In, in video games. I loot some shit off their bodies and meet the man himself, Karf Onassi, who's reluctant to answer our questions on account of the ship literally exploding with us in it. Bastila is nowhere to be found and since this is the last escape pod, it's safe to assume she took her own and crash landed on Terrace. Anyways, let's Let's leave this heap of metal. Crashing on the surface, I am knocked unconscious and Karf drags my amnesiac carcass to an abandoned apartment. We are on Terrace, a sprawling megalopolis spanning the planet's entire surface. Formerly the unofficial capital of the Outer Rim, the Coruscant of the Outer Rim if you will, a hub of commerce and culture, Terrace has since fallen into a state of decay. We will find out more about Terrace as we go on, but for now, all you need to know is that the planet is split into three levels. The further down you go, the worse it gets. The upper city is home to the planet's political and wealthy elite. The lower city is plagued by petty crime and gangs. And the under city is a sunless, monster-infested slum where the planet's undesirables, their families and descendants included, are thrown to live the rest of their lives. Ah, I like my Star Wars with a dash of North Korea. Also, all non-human species are second-class citizens with little to no rights. A nice, friendly place. When I wake up, Car fills me in on one been going on. He explains that Bastila Shan, the Jedi Padawan who disappeared during Malek's attack on the Ender Spire, is known for her mastery of battle meditation. It's a force technique that strengthens one's allies and fills the enemies with an intense sense of dread and hopelessness. Her ability is essential to the Republic's war effort, as it has been the sole weapon capable of staving off the Sith onslaught so far. However, battle meditation requires intense concentration to pull off, which explains why she couldn't use it during the attack. We also find out that the Sith are searching for Bastila and have declared martial law on Terrace. So basically, our main objectives are to locate Bastila and find a way to escape through the Sith blockade undetected. That's a easier said than done, of course, as all levels beyond the upper city are accessible only to citizens with the proper authorization. After Carve's briefing, we are finally free to explore the planet. I saved this alien from a squad of racist Sith. Netting my first light 
side points and proceed to terrorize the tenants by breaking into their apartments and looting them. I explain to a tenant that my looting is to support the war effort and that the Republic will happily reimburse them by simply filling the application that I handed to them. Is what I would have said had that dialogue option been available. <laughs> On my way out of the apartment complex, I stumble into this annoyingly aristocratic lady who, while understandably upset at my barging into her home, is grateful that I'm at least more polite than that pig Holden. Kind of a weird time to drop this info, but eh. It takes me all but two seconds to persuade Daria to reveal that Holden is a lowlife gangster that put a bounty on her head after she refused his advances and embarrassed him in front of his friends. What a spiteful little shit. I agree to help her, which kickstarts our first of many side quests. Exiting the apartment complex has us not so subtly nudged by the game to approach Karf, who seems very moody. So companions have their own stories and quests to follow through. Basically, companions will drink feed you bits of info about their lives at predetermined points in the story. This was a deliberate design decision on Bioware's part to, I don't wanna say pad the game, but simulate how real life relationships work. You gotta earn your companions trust, they won't just offer you their lives on a silver platter just because you're the protagonist. That being said, since I fucked myself out of several companion quests by not going to certain places to trigger them, I'm not going to focus too much on companions in this video. By the way, if you wanna get the most out of dialogue, get the empathy feat as soon as possible. Cool? Cool. So there's a lot of stuff to tackle on Terrace. I first head to the cantina to get the pulse of the city and potentially find a way to access the lower city. I meet this off-duty Sif officer who's surprised at my approaching her as most people on Terrace can't stand the Sif. It becomes very lonely very fast, according to her. This was a pretty interesting conversation as it makes some of the Sif seem more human. Don't get too attached to her though, she immediately goes on to lament her posting on a shitty backwater planet and explains the population how hostility towards the Sith as an attitude problem. She actually says with a straight face that they should be grateful for the current state of affairs as the Sith could have slapped a curfew on the whole planet but they chose not to. That they shouldn't be so pissy and make the best of things. Boy, it takes a special kind of narcissist to like invade the planet and then be like carpe diem, be positive, live laugh love. That would be like me barging into your house, destroying your furniture, pissing and shitting all over the place and then be being like, dude, what's with the negative energy? At least I left your TV intact upon seeing you protesting my actions. Did this woman just pioneer the concept of vibe-based military invasions? Anyways, we hit it off pretty quickly and she invites me to a party where the who's who of the Sith Junior Officer Brass will be present. Hmm. Noted. Before we bounce, we can participate in the fighting arena. The arena is a great opportunity to earn some XP by defeating your opponents, and money by placing bets at this Jabba the Hutt looking dude. Since the initial batch of opponents was relatively easy to tackle, I felt confident enough to challenge the retired champion, Ben Dak Starkiller, to a deathmatch. Oh yeah, uh, deathmatches had been outlawed sometime before the events of the game which caused Ben Dak to retire because he found non-lethal matches, uh, you know boring. In fact, deathmatches are so illegal that the HUD overseeing the arena has to pull a lot of strings to make this one happen. So let's see how this one goes. We could use those credits from these duels. But yeah, I'll uh, uh, circle back to Bendak later. Let's talk viral deadly diseases. The terrible affliction has plagued Terrace for many generations. It is spread by the Rakgulls, horrible monsters that live in the Undercity below Terrace's great skyscrapers. Prolonged exposure to the Undercity breeds the disease, and those infected will eventually mutate into Rakgulls themselves, becoming mindless beasts that feed on the flesh of others. Mm, there is no antidote for the disease, though I heard the Republic scientists at the military base here on Terrace were close to perfecting a cure. Then the Sith arrived. They overran the military base, and now they refuse to allow anyone access to the laboratories inside. The Sith are keeping all the serum for the patrols they send into the Undercity. If I could just get my hands on a sample of that serum, the Rakgul disease could be wiped from the face of Terrace forever. 
So in typical Bioware slash RPG fashion, there's usually more than one way to solve a quest. Here I can choose to hand the Ragul disease antidote to this doctor so he can mass produce it, or sell it to a gangster in the lower city and make a nice hefty profit. KOTOR has a binary morality system tailored around the franchise's light side slash dark side concept. In this case, handing the antidote to the doctor nets me light side points, while selling it for profit is the bad choice, obviously. Let's party! Hey, you may Made it. I was beginning to wonder if you were going to show. The party's in full swing. Come on in. You have to try this Teresian ale. It's fantastic. We should have conquered this planet ages ago. Careful, Sana. That wine's got quite the kick. A couple more bottles and we'll all be passed out on the floor. Who cares? We're not on duty tomorrow. Let's live a little. Come on, drink up. Boy, these civs really can hold their liquor, huh? So now that we obtained the civ uniform, we finally have the means to access the lower city and continue our search for Bastila. I make my way to the lower city and witness two gangs fighting each other in a hilariously dated in-engine cutscene. I don't know, there's just something very amusing about seeing gang members going at each other with the same clunky in-game combat animation I'd seen dozens of times in a cutscene that's supposed to introduce the gritty real part of Terrace. On a scale of 1 to Deus sex triad fight, I'd say this is a strong 8. So by this point it becomes very clear that Taurus's glossy exterior is just an illusion. Taurus is a deeply corrupted city where the criminal underworld led by crime boss Davik holds its economy and social life hostage. As much as the Theresian elite and the Sith authorities would want you to believe that only the lower levels of Taurus have a crime problem, that's not actually true. In the upper city, you'll encounter numerous people being harassed by Davik's goons. In addition, shops and businesses pay protection money to Davik. And worst of all, this is all happening with the Sith's tacit approval, who are profiting directly from Davik's rackets. I mean, sure, it gets worse the further down you go, like you'll never see gangs straight up fighting over territory in Upper Terrace, but like, even Upper Terrace citizens who you'd think are wealthy enough to insulate themselves from Davik's reach are like, legit terrified of him. And this is just one facet. I haven't even touched on the systemic racism and Terrace's caste-based society that practices the literal deportation of undesirables, whether human or alien, to the lowest level of the planet for eternity. This is why I've always ranked Taurus pretty high up despite being considered one of the weaker planets within the community. I love games that explore these corrupt, crime-ridden urban environments. Kotor's analysis may be skin deep, but at least it makes an honest attempt. At any rate, the next phase of the main quest takes us to the lower city cantina, which is identical to its upper city counterpart save from some tiny visual flourishes meant to convey the idea that it's in the bad part of town. First, we see this absolute chad of a bounty hunter called Callow Nord annihilating some gang members who got a healthy dose of fuck around and find out. He doesn't talk to them, he counts to three. Funnily, he does the same to me when I approach him, even though my intentions are purely conversational. Callow Nord is essential to the plot, so this fight is impossible to win. Whatever, nerd, I'll kill you later in the obligatory scripted plot convenient encounter. Much like in Upper Terrace, the Lore City Cantina functions as a quasi a social hub where the player drives the story forward and picks up side quests. We find out that Davik, or as I like to call him, Space Whitey Bulger, has a ship fast enough to bypass the Sith blockade. You know, I was torn between calling Davik Space John Gotti or Space Whitey Bulger until my friend and fellow YouTuber Cult of the Cyber Skull pointed out that not only is Davik not slick enough to be Gotti, he also sounds like Whitey Bulger when you listen to him speak. It'd be hilarious if Davik was indeed based on Whitey Bulger. Anyways, even with Davik's ship, there's still the issue of the orbital laser which has to be manually deactivated from the Sith military base in the upper city. By the way, this is Holden, the same dude who put a bounty on Dia's head. I convince him to lift the bounty for a measly 200 credits and he just disappears from the game forever. Speaking of which, the cantina is also where you can pick up bounties from Zax, a nearly identical hut to the one we met on the surface. 
Funnily enough, I had already proactively cleared all the bounties just by exploring, so our interactions were like, I need you to kill X for 100 credits, and I was like, well, I already handled it, and then he went, oh shit, really? Okay, here's 100 credits, and then I was like, well, how about more? And then he went, okay, what Jabba the Clown here didn't know was that I didn't so much kill the targets as I invalidated some of the bounties. For example, I helped one guy stage his own death by planting a bomb in his apartment. To which even Zax remarked that it was a bit overkill. <laughs> the most important bit in the cantina is meeting Mission and Zalbar. Mission is a Twi'lek roguish type with a sharp wit, tons of street smarts and a heart of gold. Zalbar is her wookie best friend and muscle. Mission gives us some info about the two swoop gangs vying for control over the streets of the lower city, the Volkers and the Bex. She then sets up a meet with the leader of the Bex gang who may or may not know something about some Republic escape pods that crash landed in the area. What are swoop gangs? Uh, basically space bikers, because they ride swoop bikes, which are uh, space bikes. Before meeting the gang boss, I made a little detour to wrap up some unfinished business. By this point, I am strong enough to challenge Bendak to combat in the arena. The fight is not exactly a cakewalk. I recall stunlocking him with grenades in previous playthroughs, which didn't work in this one for some reason. But after a bit of safe scumming, I slay him and net some bad boy points for good measure. I got the tidy sum from both the arena boss and Zax, because surprising absolutely no one, there was a bounty on Bendax head. By the way, KOTOR has that same early 2000s RPG hub area issue where certain locations are closer to each other than they should be. Like the Volker and Beck bases who are at war by the way are barely a few feet apart from each other. I do realize that KOTOR was developed with the original Xbox in mind and there's only so much open space that the console can render without like, you know, exploding. But come on, there's barely enough space to stage half a drive-by shooting here. These trees barely register as streets, they're more like bridges. I don't know, it's it's fine. Alright, so Gaddon, the Bex leader, is a pretty interesting dude. For one, he's suspiciously trusting and affable for a man who runs one of the most powerful gangs in the second most shadiest part of Terrace. I guess he's one of the good ones, he only runs protection rackets with a bit of drug dealing sprinkled on top. Well, after a bit of digging, I discovered that the hidden Bex gained a lot of clout with the locals when they joined the Tresian resistance against the Mandalorian invasion, earning their reputation as one of the more honorable swoop gangs. In addition, the feud between the Hidden Bex and the Volkers turned bloody only when Gaddon's adopted son and heir apparent, Brezhik, joined and took over the Volkers after Gaddon refused to relinquish leadership to Brezhik. Until this feud, the beef rarely turned violent as the gangs used swoop races to settle disputes. So the Hidden Bex may actually be less of a gang and more of a space motorcycle club. Still, the game doesn't really explain how they earn their money to own slash rent this this huge ass base, but whatever. I can't pose the what do they eat question in every fucking video I make. So it doesn't take much effort to get Gaden to talk. The escape pod containing Bastila crashed into the Undercity and was picked clean by the Volkers who took her into slavery. The Volkers put her as the prize for the next swoop race for some reason, so to save her we have to participate and win. Problem is, the Volkers stole an experimental swoop engine from the hidden Bex and without the engine we have no chance to win. So, we are to connect with Mission in the Undercity, sneak into the Volker base through the back entrance and steal the engine back. Complicating things is the fact that only authorized personnel are allowed into the Undercity. Fortunately, Gaddon is willing to trade the documentation for the Sith uniform, so that's settled. Cool. The Undercity is as shitty as everybody made it out to be. We get some very interesting insights about life in the Undercity from this young lady whose family was banished generations ago into the depths of Terrace. So the story is that several centuries before the events of the game, Teresian industrialists killed most of the oceanic fauna and flora, causing a planet-wide food shortage. Seeing the writing on the wall, the Teresian elite hoarded the remaining resources while the poor were left to starve and die. The Teresian poor rebelled in an event known as the Teresian Civil War. The rebellion was crushed by the Teresian government, who then banished the rebels to the Undercity. During KOTOR's events, the Undercity has become a sort of prison colony, where the Teresian elite banished the poor, whether guilty of a crime or not, to preserve resources. It's a purely greed-driven scheme and it's pretty fucked up. The lady also talks about the so-called Promised Land, a legendary self-sufficient settlement located somewhere deep in the Undercity. 
Italy. There's not much to say about this quest. It boils down to tracking three journals left behind by some dead explorers and handing them to either the village elder or this shady merchant. The former results in the entire population leaving the village to search for this promised land, while the latter has the merchant destroying the journals and thus any proof of the promised land's existence. You wanna hear his reasoning? Uh, if we leave for the promised land, people won't buy shit from me anymore and I'll become irrelevant. Well, yeah, but surely the prospect of ending up in a self-sufficient settlement is better than selling secondhand scrap for a living for the rest of your life, right? I don't know, whatever man. Anyways, it's time to leave the village, connect with mission and hopefully find a cure for the ragul disease as the outcasts clearly need it. Please, you have to help me. Nobody else is gonna help me, even the Bex won't help me. But I can't just leave him there, he, he's my friend. You'll help me, won't you? It's Zalbar, he's in trouble. Big trouble. Ah, looks like Zalbar got into a bit of trouble. And the sewers are filled with Gamorian slavers, whatever the fuck that means. Cool. So Mission is the first companion to join your party after Karf. As I said in the intro like a million years ago, KOTOR is all about leveraging your companion's skills. In this case, Mission is a scoundrel specialized in stealth and demolitions, so I spec her accordingly. She is a great addition to my party as she is not only apt at disabling and retrieving the dozens of mines littering the Undercity, She's also a great ranged fighter. There are a few things we can do before heading to the sewers that lead to the Volker base. First, a Sith Patrol leader fills us in on a Sith Patrol that had been eviscerated by a pack of rag ghouls. Since we know from the Upper City Doctor that Sith squads stationed in the Undercity are issued rag ghoul serums, we can go and snatch it without attracting the ire of the Sith. We can also pay a visit to the escape pods where we'll find a Republic soldier in the process of mutating. We can either give him the serum or let nature run its course and kill him. Now this is a bit of a false choice because if we cure him he ends up devoured by a pack of mutants anyway so yeah kinda annoying. Last but not least we can assist a squad of mercenaries and have a chat with their leader Kandorus who's also on Davik's payroll. Hmm. So I'm gonna speed through the rest of the Undercity because honestly, as much as I like Taurus, I'm getting kind of sick of this planet. The sewers come with two noteworthy events. First, we save Zalbar and he swears a life dead to us, effectively joining our party. Then there is a rancor that we can Looney Tunes out of existence by planting bait and a grenade in the nearby body pile. Next up is the Volker base and the garage. It's at this point where I realize I am absolutely fucking stacked with supplies, guns, blades and armor upgrades that I have no idea what to do with. I am also substantially weaker than my companions who mop the floor with these gangsters like season 2 Barry Berkman. Thankfully I am not entirely useless as I leverage my computer skills to download the map of the area and open all locked security doors. Yay, I'm useful. So here we're presented with the first real dark side slash light side choice. One of Brezhek's cronies offers me 500 credits and Bastala if I betray Gaden and kill him instead. But then he's like, yeah, you also have to win the race, which is like, I don't want to participate in some stupid race, so... I killed him. Okay, the race. God, this planet is getting on my nerves. So swoop races are not very impressive. They basically boil down to driving over these pressure plates to gain momentum and pressing left click when this bar fills up to get a speed boost. And that's about it. So surprise surprise, Brezhik is a sore loser and throws a shit fit about me cheating. Obviously, he plans to withdraw the cash price and sell Bastila on the slave market. Then, in one of the most blatant plot contrivances in this game, Bastila snaps out of her trance, breaks out of the cage and proceeds to destroy the Volkers. Why didn't she do this before? It could've saved us a lot of trouble. Anyway, I kill Brezhik and yeah, Bastila does not make a good first impression. I know she's written to be a young, pompous, arrogant Jedi, but she'd also been sold as a skilled leader who her peers look up to. I guess her battle meditation literally nullifies the social consequences of her arrogance. I don't know. Okay, let's actually bust out of this planet before I go insane. After a bit of back and forth, we meet up with Davik's right hand man, Kandorus, in the lower city cantina. He's unhappy with his current boss and being stuck on this planet, so he cooks up an escape plan that has us breaking into the local Sith base using a robot companion to steal the launch codes and then going to Davik's estate and stealing his ship. 
cool. I made the Sith base trivial by hacking into its security systems and disabling the killer robots and disposed of the Sith governor through skill and strategy. By which I mean my character was so shit that I had no choice but to put a little more thought into planning the fight than before. We can also help the alien with save at the beginning of the game escape, which is a pretty neat coming full circle moment. We give the codes to Kandarus and then we head over to Davik's estate as a potential new recruit. Blah blah, we kill Davik's cronies, blah blah blah, oh my god I'm going insane, blah blah, oh, Kalo, eh, and he dies with Davik. And we steal their ship. Lord Malak then decides to destroy the planet to kill Bastila, but we escape just in time to get a full view of all our effort and choices being grazed into insignificance. Cool. Next destination, Dantooine, the Jedi Enclave. So Dantooine kicks off with our guy having visions of some sort that are definitely not foreshadowing a potential plot twist. His visions consist of Bastila defeating Revan and Malak and Revan having a conversation about an ancient structure called the Starforge. Much like Bastila's battle meditation, the Starforge seems to be vital to the Sith war effort but we don't know yet in what capacity nor its location. Also, our guy has a very strong sense of the force, which is very unusual for an adult, and he shares those visions with Bastila, hinting at the existence of a force bond between them. And with that, we begin our training in the ways of the Jedi. In the span of a few weeks, we master abilities that other Jedi have barely scratched the surface of after years of intense training. Meditation, telekinesis, sword fighting, uh, walking and talking, all that cool Jedi shit. After the initial training, we must complete three tests to be fully accepted in the Jedi Order. The first test is reciting the Jedi Code, which I passed by invoking an ancient Jedi technique called looking shit up on my phone. For the second test, we are to construct our own lightsaber. My master makes it out to be this mystical, transcendental ritual, when in fact all it comes down to is interfacing with the in-game workbench. Another thing we need to do is choose a Jedi class. There are three classes, Guardian, Sentinel and Consular. Guardians focus on raw strength and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Consulars are masters of the force and Sentinels are a mix of both. I went with Sentinel because some internet guide said it's the best. I'm, I'm kidding. Mostly. After choosing my class, I get to unlock two Jedi powers. There's a large suite of powers split into three categories light side powers, dark side powers, and universal powers. Technically, you're free to choose any power regardless of your leaning, but there will be restrictions, like dark side powers costing more points to cast for light side characters and vice versa. So you should mostly stick to your alignment unless you're a Jedi Consular or its dark side equivalent, who get tons of force points at the expense of raw strength. It's a pretty interesting system if a bit inflexible, like there's no reason to go for a grey slash neutral Jedi because you're literally stunting your character's development. With that said and done, it's time to receive our third and final assignment. Word on the street is that the ancient grove once used for meditation by the Jedi has been tainted by evil, unleashing a wave of bad vibes that has turned the local fauna, especially calf hounds, aggressive and ruthless. We are to locate and destroy the source of dark energy before it becomes too much to handle for the locals. Cool. I decided to have a chat with the Jedi Council before proceeding with my task. There is nothing interesting here with the only notable bit being this dude who straight up blue balls me. Dudes like, we have this big ass library that holds millennia worth of Jedi knowledge. We're talking stuff that will absolutely blow your fucking mind like you couldn't believe the crazy shit we have here dude. And I'm like, well can I see it? And he's like, ah no only like super old Jedi can go there. Fucking what? Then why the hell tell me in the first place? Show me the books, you freaking nerd. The Jedi Council also provides a bit of context on Malak and Revan. Apparently, it's not as simple as them joining the Mandalorian War and then suddenly turning to the dark side upon returning from their trip into uncharted space. Something happened there. Malak and Revan witnessed something so transformative that it outright reconfigured their way of thinking and being. And the Jedi are scared shitless. Because if there exists a force or entity or whatever powerful enough to corrupt Jedi as virtuous as Revan and Malak, 
then the Jedi Order and the galaxy as a whole is truly doomed. So there's a good reason why Dantooine is considered one of the weaker planets. Dantooine is uh, very visually uninteresting. It's basically a farm planet with not much in the way of interesting stuff to see. It consists of large stretches of grassy plains, hills, rivers, with the odd settlement here and there. I guess it makes sense as the location of a Jedi Academy as I can't deny the planet exudes something of a meditative vibe, but from a gameplay and exploration perspective, it's... It's rough. It's not only visually bland, it's a slog due to the abundance of loading screens. Here's the map of Dantooine as illustrated by Reddit user... Uh, sorry, I don't know if I can pronounce that. So here's, uh, here's the name on the screen. As you can see, there are a lot of loading screens and Dantooine does feature a lot of backtracking. Again, I am aware that KOTOR was developed for the original Xbox and that these loading screens were necessary, but it's made exploration age horribly. And don't even get me started on the encounter design. God, I hate fighting calf hounds. They're everywhere. The Mandalorians are fun to fight though. Why do you all ask me to voice these people in your videos? Like, what am I missing here? Mark? Mark, where am I? Mark? Mark? Oh god. So while we could go straight for the main objective, there is a fair bit of side content we can pursue. We can help the locals eradicate a group of Mandalorians that have been harassing and killing settlers and farmers, locate this lady's missing companion, and solve a murder mystery. While these quests may seem unrelated, they do share a common theme. You see, the Jedi are not just an order of space monks that happen to set up shop on Dantooine. The Jedi also serve the role as mediators and problem solvers. These people rely on the Jedi to settle disputes and enforce the law. At the same time, the locals are rightfully frustrated at the Jedi's lack of initiative. Things like addressing the core of the problem and long-term solutions have never crossed the Jedi's minds. They're purely reactive and even then they're very slow to act. John here has every right to be pissed at the Jedi. The Jedi could have done more to address the Mandalorian problem. They didn't, and now his daughter is dead. I am not a big fan of the Jedi, as you can see. I've always found their ideology and philosophy and teachings and, well, everything kinda nonsense. Their undeniable cool factor has steadily lost its luster as I've grown older. I'm bored of the Jedi, I'm so over their bullshit. So the missing companion quest is uh, more bizarre than I remembered. This lady is like, my husband passed away and my companion is missing, can you please find them because I literally don't know what they do without them, okay. But then the conversation takes a turn for the creepy and it becomes apparent that the lady has something of an obsession for her companion. Well, it turns out that her companion is a droid and they haven't so much gone missing as they ran away because they were creeped out by the woman's clinginess. The droid begs us to end their misery as they believe this is the only way their master will ever pursue a healthy relationship with an actual, you know, human sentient being, whatever. Now, this is the kind of shit I want from my Star Wars media, not the emph story about John Skywalker the 15th or whatever obscure Jedi conveniently survived Order 66. I know my take is far from original, but I just felt like getting this off my chest. The murder mystery side quest is one of my favorite pieces of side content in KOTOR. It's one of those cases of simple concept, great execution. You have a murder victim, Two suspects with strong motives, a Jedi mediator, and a detective droid to cross-check evidence with. The way this quest works is pretty simple. There's a round of questioning the suspects and the droid followed by reporting your findings to Jedi Master Boluk. If you give Boluk the correct answers, the quest will advance to the next round of questioning and evidence gathering. The fact that you have to give Boluk the correct answers to advance the investigation to the next phase strikes me as pretty bizarre. because. How would he know that you're on the right path? Has Boluk already solved the mystery and is merely testing me? If that's the case, how did he know we'd cross paths? Did he order the suspects to hang around the murder scene just in case a specific Jedi prospect came by? You know what? It doesn't matter. It's a good mystery and a good quest. So it turns out the evil force corrupting the meditation grove is a fallen Jedi by the name of Juhani. After defeating her... <clears throat> 
After pumping an ungodly amount of battle stimulants into my bloodstream and defeating her, I kinda convinced her to change her mind. From what I've read, this is one of the harder social encounters in the game, but I passed all persuasion checks without any trouble. It must be my natural IRL charisma spilling over into the game. Or maybe I put enough points into persuasion to make this encounter trivial. I don't know, probably the latter. So I'm a Jedi now, which means it's time for my first true assignment as a member of the Order. I am to enter an ancient structure standing at the east of the Jedi Enclave. Yes, the one from the vision I shared with Bastila, and explore the ruins for clues as to the location of the Starforge. The Council, as annoyingly cryptic as ever, refuses to explain why these ruins are tied to my destiny and why they decided to send another Jedi to investigate if I am so crucial to the completion of this task. Then this dude storms into the room and goes, Central family is a blight upon Dantooine. They must be punished. The Council will look into this matter, Mr. Metale. You must be patient. Your accusations have no proof, and we do not want you stirring up trouble with the Sandrals if there is some mistake. Mistake? My son Shen is missing. How can there be any doubt the Sandrals are to blame? So I have to deal with this mess too. Dude, I just got here. Why do I have to act as the middleman between two bickering rich families? Isn't this like high level Jedi master diplomacy stuff? So you're basically telling me that I'm too much of a Jedi dum-dum to read some stupid ancient Jedi books from your stupid Jedi library, but I am somehow qualified to broker peace between two stupid rich families whose feud goes back generations? Fucking what? Why why don't you do it, Master Vorak or Vruk or whatever the fuck your name is? Oh, yeah, wait, you're too busy sitting on your ass all day and judging me. If you find me overly critical, perhaps it is because you do not fully understand what is at stake. Fuck but you, get a job. Ugh. Anyway, I deal with that and make my way to the ruins. I stumble into this ancient insect-like robot that spits several death grips beats at me until it settles on a language I can understand. <laughs> So this is the Overseer. The Builders, an ancient race of super advanced aliens, programmed the Overseer to enforce discipline among the slaves and ensure that the temple is constructed according to the wishes of the Builders. The Builders envisioned this temple as a sort of monument to the Starforge's greatness. At project completion, all slaves were executed and the Overseer was reprogrammed to guard the temple should the Builder return to seek the knowledge of the Starforge. So the Overseer is basically a glorified mall cop right now. The Overseer points out that in order to access the knowledge of the Starforge, we must prove ourselves worthy by entering the Proving Grounds and understanding the will of the Builders. The Proving Grounds are two small attack droid filled rooms adjacent to the Overseer, and understanding the will of the Builders involves solving a few riddles before the temple's security systems kill us. Interestingly, in one of the computers used to solve the riddles, there is an easter egg referencing a volcanic planet that was cut from the game. Also, uh, I now have a permanent speed boost because force speed glitched out. Anyways, I solve the riddles, unseal the doors to the final chamber and discover what Revan and Malak found when they entered the temple. A map. Or rather, a chunk of the star map that Revan and Malak used to find the Starforge. To find the Starforge ourselves, we must retrace the duo's steps and locate the four remaining star maps on Tatooine, Kashyyyk, Manan and Korriban. Ah, fuck, this is gonna be a long video. Back on the Ebon Hawk, I am given the choice of which planet to hit first. This is when the game finally opens up. The game leaves it up to the player to decide the order in which they visit the planets. So, after doing some research, aka bugging my friend and Kotor scholar Girakian on Discord, I settled on the following order Tatooine, Kashyyyk, Manan and Korriban. Mind you, there is an optimal planet order, but the game doesn't punish you for not following it. In fact, it's recommended you mix up the planet order on subsequent playthroughs as certain quests and events play out differently, which adds a lot to the replay value. Oh, and remember the bounty hunter who got caught lacking and died under a heap of rubble over at Davik's estate? Not only has Kalonord survived, he also took a job with Darth Malak, so I'm sure we'll see more of him later. Okay, let's go to Tatooine.
so much like its movie counterpart, Tatooine is a godforsaken desert shithole which is my second favorite genre of shithole after the post-communist shithole. I am greeted by a representative from Space Nestle who tries to shake me down for 100 credits, a docking fee as he calls it to cover for expenses. I guess calling him Tony and having him speak in a Brooklyn accent would have been too on the nose, so the writer settled on corpo mafia adjacent euphemisms. Being the suave smooth talking negotiator that I am, I managed to bring the fee down to a more reasonable zero credits for the current and all future landings by, well, hovering the cursor over the force persuade dialogue option and selecting it. With the landing fee issue resolved, I channeled my inner Kendall Roy and started probing the Zerka employee about the plays, moves and vibes on Tatooine. Apparently Zerka Corporation set up shop on Tatooine after being bamboozled by a rival company into thinking that it would be a profitable business endeavor. The rival company sold their claim on the planet to Zerka and fucked off. By the time Zerka higher-ups realized that the geological surveys that the rival company provided were juked and possibly an attempt at corporate sabotage, Zerka had already gotten too invested into Tatooine to retreat without facing bankruptcy. While Zerka managed to do some mining, there was no escaping the fact that the ore was flawed and that the entire operation was a clown show. With mining becoming increasingly expensive, Zerka had to look at other forms of business and proceeded to turn their operations on Tatooine into a glorified mafia racket. Zerka swamped the planet into layers of bureaucracy and seized its small but bustling hunting industry by forbidding settlers to hunt without a very expensive license sold by, you guessed it, Zerka. On top of that, they make all of their workers sign away their rights to compensation in case of workplace injury and death. Yeah, Zerka is uh, not a good company. As hilarious as the idea of a company the size of Zerka falling for a trust me bro ruse might be, it becomes less funny when you realize that it's the regular people who ended up suffering the fallout of this corporate ruse. Not the overpaid Zerka executives who couldn't be bothered to skim through the business proposal and double check the numbers. Sadly, as we'll see later when we get to Kashyyyk, the Tatooine fiasco ranks pretty low on the list of fucked up shit Zerka has done. On the same docking bay, I am approached by a delivery worker who lets me know that a special shipment of Giska has been successfully delivered to my ship. My character has absolutely no recollection of ordering a package, much less one containing Giska. But I guess anything is possible on this clown planet. We're in a rush, so we'll have to figure out what these Giska are a bit later. So at this stage, I could just as easily go for the main objective. But there are a few activities to hit. First, there's this lady caught in a Kafkaesque bureaucratic nightmare. Her husband, a hunter and the sole breadwinner of the family, was killed out in the dunes. All she has left is a hunting trophy, but she can sell it to the hunting lodge without a Zerka Corporation approved hunting license which she obviously can't afford. Our options are as follows. We buy the trophy off of her, we persuade the woman to entrust us with the trophy, buy a hunting license and sell it to the hunting lodge and give her the credits, or the heartless bastard route of taking the trophy, selling it and pocketing the money. I had to do some shopping anyway, so I sold some of my junk and bought the trophy directly from the poor woman. While it's a pretty simple quest in concept, it perfectly illustrates the ripple effects caused by Zerka's inhumane business practices. Upon exiting the Zerka offices where we were offered the hunting license, in exchange for eliminating the sand people tribe roaming outside the city, we are greeted by a conservationist who asks us to infiltrate and negotiate peace with the sand people. I am all for fucking over greedy corporations, so I take him up on his offer. Then we can save a hunter whose wife trapped him with his own droids and left him to die in the desert. Don't worry, he deserved it. Finally, we can help some miners ward off waves of sand people. While most of these quests are short and sweet, the sand people quest is more involved and requires jumping through several hoops. For one, nobody has managed to communicate with the sand people. Not that they've ever tried. Luckily, I got wind of a merchant who had a droid that can. He wants 5,000 credits for the droid, but you can talk him down to 3,000 if your persuasion is high enough. I still couldn't afford the droid, so I signed myself up for the local swoop racing tournament to raise the cash for the droid. By the way, nobody believes you when you mention that you won the swoop championship on Terrace as all records were all the run together with the planet. Anyways, with my swoop championship title secure, I circle back to the shop owner, exchange a bunch of race bonds for cash money and purchase the droid. So HK47 is one of the best characters in this game, if not the 
entire history of video games. He's a sassy, bloodthirsty assassination droid with a high enough body count to make Max Payne blush. He lies when he needs to, calls all non-droids organic meat bags, and throws a shit fit when I try to mess around with his circuitry and when the shop owner says he's worn out. He calls me master sarcastically as his programming prevents him from addressing me in any other way. He has a god complex rivaling System Shock's Shodan. The only thing he knows is killing, which he is more than happy to do at my behest. I absolutely love HK-47. With HK-47 added to our party, we may as well head out into the desert and try and broker peace with the Sand People. Since the Sand People haven't been made privy of our peacekeeping mission, my party got attacked by their warriors from every direction. Fortunately, we managed to secure some disguises, which made our infiltration efforts a whole lot easier, until we got recognized as outsiders as soon as we stepped into the Sand People's enclave. After some back and forth between HK-47 and the guard, we meet the chieftain, who was in absolute disbelief that we made it this far. In exchange for letting us go peacefully and reducing their attacks on miners, he requires proof of good faith in the form of a moisture vaporizer from Zerka which I happily oblige. By the way, the corporate drone that tasked me with eliminating the Sand People Enclave wants nothing less than their total destruction, so we'll have to find a way to trick her into thinking we yeeted them. Back in the Enclave, the Chieftain is absolutely shocked that we held our end of the bargain. He still doesn't trust me, but since we have done more than any other outsider, he promises to slow down the attacks on the miners, donates his tribal scepter to serve as proof of their elimination to Zerka, and provides a Map with the star map's location. It's in a cave. I'm sure it's empty. So I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that we found the cave containing the star map not far from the Sand People Enclave. The bad news is that it's guarded by a gigantic space dragon that's nearly impossible to kill without resorting to uh creative hunting methods. Luckily, our hunter buddy set up a minefield in front of the cave. So all we need to do now is lure the dragon out in the open by herding a pack of bantas to the cave's entrance. Which is easier said than done as my party is immediately attacked by waves of sand people who apparently didn't get the memo. Anyways, the dragon goes boom and we secure the star map. On our way back, we are of course greeted by Chad Nord and his posse of intergalactic gangsters. My party had come a long way since Staris, so Nord and his group posed no danger to us. Alright, let's get off this dump. Cash Kashyyyk, otherwise known as the Wookiee planet, is our next destination. In transit, shit's getting officially real on the Ebon Hawk. There's romantic tension between me and Bastila. Karf, a deeply traumatized individual and one of the most misunderstood characters in the game, opens up to us. He was betrayed by his mentor who swore allegiance to Malak and proceeded to bomb Kart's home planet, killing his family. Kandorus brags about his exploits during the Mandalorian Wars. Kandorus is a murderous, bloodthirsty scumbag who actively participated in the slaughtering of millions of people. Still, I can't help but respect him in a way because he knows exactly what he is and is quick to dismiss any pretense of him being anything other than a pure warrior following the Mandalorian code of war. With Kandorus, what you see is what you get. And the weird thing is that he holds no ill will towards Revan and the Republic for annihilating his people. From his point of view, the Republic was the better combatant and they beat them fair and square. It also helps that the dude's a brilliant storyteller, peppering his stories with little flourishes in the odd anecdote as to make these events of impossible to comprehend galactic scale more relatable. So on Kashyyyk we are greeted by yet another Zerka employee who tries to shake us down for a docking fee. In keeping with my philosophy of not paying a single dime to these corporate parasites, I wave my Jedi wand and convince him that I don't need to pay anything. <laughs> Should not be Shut up, Bastila. Also, our companion Zalbar has some unfinished business on Kashyyyk that may or may not be connected to our main objective to locate the star map. Earlier, I said that Zerka's predatory business practices on Tatooine pale in comparison to their exploits on Kashyyyk. Well, turns out... Zerka has set up a pretty lucrative slaving operation on Kashyyyk with the complicity of a Wookiee chieftain called Chandar, 
who Zalbar is reluctant to discuss. The arrangement is so incredibly fucked up in its simplicity. Chandar gives Wookiees to Zerka and Zerka gives weapons to Chandar. Why does Zerka need live Wookiees? Medical and biological experiments, apparently. Not only that, but these Zerka motherfuckers have the audacity to declare that this operation is very humane, and that even the Wookiee leadership knows it's more beneficial to work with them. As Kashyyyk's status as a non-aligned planet puts it outside the Republic's sphere of influence, influence with its laws and protections and, you know, basic rights. This seems not only cynical, but incredibly convenient. There must be more to this arrangement than meets the eye. We gotta go meet this Chandor dude and see what's up. But not until we waddle through waves upon waves of trash mobs interspersed with the occasional micro-story event. This is the Great Walkway, a network of walkways connecting the Zerka outpost to the Wookiee village from which Chandor has been selling his own people to a ruthless galactic corporation. No offense to the Wookiee culture, but I hate the Great Walkway with a passion. The Great Walkway marked the first time in the playthrough I did for this video when I felt like the game was testing my patience. It's an excruciating 30 minute slog where aside from two or three small story encounters, you do nothing but fight droves of these mantis like creatures. It didn't help that thanks to my own stupidity I was still pretty weak for this point in the game and I relied mostly on my companions to deal reliable damage. Since Zalbar is a required party member in the first part of Kashyyyk, the game does this occasionally for story reasons, I Frankensteined him into a powerful melee ranged tank hybrid capable of sustaining massive amounts of damage, which made the Great Walkway a lot more tolerable. Bastila was my main support slash healer and she was doing a decent job of it. I was also absolutely stacked with utility items that confer passive bonuses to my attributes as well as party and 1980s Miami quantities of injectable stimulants which I abused before every important fight including this encounter with a group of Dark Jedi. Anyways, turns out Chandar is Zalbar's brother and Zalbar was exiled from Kashyyyk for attacking his brother with his climbing claws, violating an important Wookiee code of conduct. Because of this, Zalbar is now known as a Mad Claw, a title of dishonor which renders the holders effectively social pariahs. Of course, it's more uh, complicated than this. Long story short, Zalbar and Chandar are the sons of Freyr, a mighty Wookiee chieftain who, much like Zalbar, was exiled many years ago. Prior to this, Zalbar caught wind of Chandar's plans to do business with the Zerka Corporation and attacked him with his climbing claws. Freyr, then naive to Chandar's evil intentions, banished Zalbar from Kashyyyk, only to have his title usurped when he eventually discovered that Zalbar was right all along. And this is where we are now, Chandar selling his own people to Zerka in secret with the help of a small group of loyalists, while the rest of the tribe sees him as a hero for dethroning the tyrannical Mad Claw former chieftain. Chandar imprisons Zalbar for not honoring his exile. In exchange for his freedom, we are to descend into the Shadowlands and kill another Wookiee Mad Claw who had been pestering Chandar's Zerka allies. The Shadowlands is the, uh, like, ground level of Kashyyyk's forests. It's a very dangerous place that even Wookiees enter only for ritual hunting. We also know for a fact from the visions we shared with Bastila that the star map is located somewhere in the Shadowlands. So Chandar here played himself big time by forcing us to do his dirty work because one, it gives us some breathing room to dig around for proof of his dealings with Zerka and two, we had to go there anyway. Great work Chandar. So the Shadowlands is exactly what it sounds like. A damp, dark and foggy place inhabited by Katarns, Terentatex and savage beasts called Mandalorians. I like the Shadowlands. It looks pretty, it's very atmospheric and most crucially it's 10 orders of magnitude more pleasant to play through than the Great Walkway. I pulled that number out of my ass but that doesn't make it less true. Well, there is one problem though. <laughs> Who the hell thought looping that monkey sound every 5 seconds was a good idea? At any rate, the Shadowlands is where we meet the last of our companions, Joe Lee Bendo. 
Jolie is a stubborn, grumpy old Jedi living in the Kashyyyk wilderness for the past decade or so. You'd think living in the Shadowlands would earn him the respect of the natives, but even the Wookiees think he must be absolutely insane for choosing to live there willingly. Anyways, it turns out Jolie is perfectly sane if a bit forgetful and easily distracted, though I like to think that is part of his grumpy old man act. While Jolie doesn't talk much about himself, he lets out his disinterest in debating the lights side dark side dichotomy almost immediately, preferring a more nuanced view on this issue. Mind you, he doesn't want to discuss it, he just prefers it. We need more people like Jolie Bendo. You have no idea how many nights out in the city I've had ruined by random tryhards who are dead set on debating pointless philosophical topics after overhearing and misinterpreting a snippet of conversation from my table. Just let me drink my beer in peace. Also, Jolie is a Jedi Counselor sitting smack dab in the middle of the alignment graphic, which means that we can turn him into a force power wielding powerhouse. The, I, that sounded better in writing. <laughs> we can also safely add some dark side powers to his arsenal and compensate for the penalties thanks to his class and alignment. So our task is to drive away some Zerka fuckheads poaching a local species called Tatch, whose glands are used to make the region ail. That's the same alcoholic beverage that knocked those Sith officers on their asses back on Taris, by the way. All we have to do is deactivate two of these little radars keeping the predators at bay and a rancor-like beast will barge in to vacate the premises. It's a funny little quest partially because literally no one except the corporate Zerka drone wanted to be there, but mostly due to it being the result of Jolie wanting these pesky Zerka officers off his lawn. I mean, if I set up shop deep in the wilderness only to have a bunch of corporate poachers fucking around with the local fauna with their little radars 10 meters from my hut, I'd be pretty pissed too. We deal with the poachers, kill some cloaked Mandalorians who attacked only unarmed passerbys, meet with the Mad Claw Wookiee who's of course Chandar and Zalbar's exiled father Freyr, slay a dark side abomination and recover Freyr's ritualistic sword from its guts. And also we find the star map deep in the Shadowlands. Yes, there's two separate Shadowlands, don't worry about it. So the star map is protected by an AI directed to give the coordinates only to the individual matching the parameters who'd programmed it. This bit has us answering a series of questions themed around morality and stuff, with each question having only one correct answer. Judging by the fact that the answers it deems as correct fall in the nihilistic slash evil slash Machiavellian end of the spectrum, the AI seems to have been programmed by Revan himself. This puzzle forces us to put ourselves in Revan's shoes and see his point of view, aka answer as Revan would have. I didn't get the memo so the AI unleashed a group of killer robots onto my party. Even Jolie's disabled droid's power wasn't enough to prevent my party from being wiped. Another interesting tidbit the AI reveals is that Kashyyyk is the way it is due to an ecological disaster that caused the trees to grow to incredible heights. Uh, give me, give me just one second. 30,000 or so years before the founding of the Republic. You can bet the builders had a hand in this. Also, Jolie tried to access the AI 152 times out of sheer boredom, a feat for which I found him even more endearing. Sorting by identity. Three attempts by the Wookiee Freyer, all denied. 152 attempts by human Jolie Bindo, all denied. <laughs> Call me stubborn, I guess. There wasn't much else to do around here. We extract the coordinates, try to talk things out with Chandar, he refuses, I kill him, Freya resumes his role of chieftain and proceeds to fight the slavers, Zalbar and I become best friends, and off we go to the next planet. So my main takeaway on Kashyyyk is that while Tatooine had a sort of interconnected design where side quests connected with each other across several areas, Kashyyyk is more linear, with the bulk of the quests leading to the Shadowlands. I don't dislike this, but Kashyyyk's linearity might seem jarring compared to the openness of other planets assuming you visit it as your second or third or even fourth planet. Okay, next up, Manan.
In Between Planets we are treated to another Malak cutscene. Malak, very disappointed about Kalonord's failure, decides that his apprentice, Darth Bandon, has a better chance of standing against a Jedi of my stature. As if on cue, Darth Bandon comes into the room and causes like 4 billion credits worth of property damage before slowly walking to his master and accepting the task. I guess he must have been like, hanging outside the room? And what about the property damage? Does Malak dock Bandon's pay for every piece of equipment he destroys? I guess there must be a clause in Bandon's contract allowing for X number of Sith shit tantrums per month without penalty. Otherwise, that shit you just pull there, Bandon, that's just that's just fiscally irresponsible, okay? So Monan is a huge ass ocean planet. The only above surface settlement on the planet is Achto City where we'll be spending the majority of our time. For the first time ever, I am not harassed by Zerka operatives for protection money. Instead of Zerka employees, I get to watch a Republic soldier and a Sith officer duking it out in the lobby like a couple of toddlers. Not for individual gain. Ha! Don't make me laugh, you gutless simp. It's the destiny of weak-minded fools like you to be ruled over by the strong like we Sith. I'm warning you. Monan is amongst my favorite locations in Kotor because it's the least Star Wars-y planet, if that makes any sense. So while up until now we've seen Kotor adopt most of the Star Wars tropes and iconography we've all come to love and scoff at in equal measure, Jedis, Sand People, Wookiees, whatever, as if checking things off a list at gunpoint, we all know George Lucas is holding the gun in this hypothetical scenario, Monan marks the point where Kotor finally gets a little weird and experimental. Believe it or not, the cutscene the Sith officer and a Republic soldier roasting each other sets the tone for the planet pretty well. The reason why they're arguing instead of whipping out their blasters has to do with Manan's special political status. See, Achto City sits on top of the galaxy's sole reservoir of Kolto, a precious liquid sought out by the Republic and the Sith for its powerful healing qualities. Their monopoly on Kolto allowed the Selkath, Manan's native species, to go, we'll let both of you chill on the planet as long as you play nice with each other and respect or autonomy. If not, we'll like destroy the Kolto and none of you gets the tasty sea juice. So, we got a planet with a precious resource that you can't find anywhere else. Two warring factions, both seeking said resource, reduced to a pathetic game of chicken. And a native species playing both sides of the conflict for a profit. You can bet your ass the Sith and the Republic are in full Tinker Tailor Soldier spy mode. Tinker Tailor Soldier Star Wars? Whatever, you get the idea. What strikes me about this planet even more so than its overtly political theme is the lengths to which the devs went to illustrate the minutiae of this strange arrangement. Beyond the public displays of hostility and bravado, there is a sense of uneasiness, of uncertainty in the air. As if the Sith and the Republic don't quite know what to do once they've exhausted all their creative insults. They've been fighting for so long and now they just have to kinda tolerate each other in public while the spies are doing their thing in the background? Bioware's decision to set all this on Manan also deserves some notice, as the idyllic almost quaint peacefulness of Manan makes for a tragic comic contrast to the scheming and spying occurring behind the scenes. Another aspect I want to touch on concerns the Selkath. Now Bioware could have just as well left the Selkath in the periphery and focused all their attention on the Sith Republic conflict, but the Selkath, particularly the web of interests and political motivations revolving around the issue of Manan's neutrality, are given just as much screen time. So unsurprisingly, the Selkath are not a monolith, there isn't a consensus regarding Manan's alignment. There's a ton of nuance. Some Selkath are hardliners, thinking that the planet's cultural reserves are too great of a strategic advantage to waste by aligning with one side or the other. Other Selkath feel iffy about this arrangement particularly the allowing the objectively evil Sith to chill on their planet part. Another common opinion in this camp is that Sith being Sith, it's only a matter of time until they drop any pretense of respecting Manan's neutrality and attempt to seize its cultural reserves for themselves. So the Selkaf may as well join the Republic. And other Selkaf are, well, they're pure Sith apologists. They think the Republic is weak and corrupt and that Manan has nothing but to gain by joining the Sith. I can't say I don't see where they're coming from. The Republic is not only losing the war, it had been affected by institutional decay way before this war. But come on, what do they think is going to happen if they join the Sith? They are just as naive as the neutrality camp 
who have repeatedly been so, so comically oblivious to the Sith's true intentions. As you can see, I like this planet quite a bit. It's not only thematically interesting, it's also the prettiest to look at. I don't know, there's just something about the idea of an above water city baked in the sunlight of an eternal afternoon that I find so very enticing. Though for all its visual strengths, Manan has the same problem I noticed on Dantooine. It's an absolute chore to navigate. The issue is not so much the abundance of loading screens as the layout of the city, with its sectors arranged successively instead of branching out from a central hub, meaning that a complete trip across the map involves going through three or four loading screens. Granted, on my 2023 rig, the loading screens are over quickly, but this must have been a nightmare in 2003. So the first chunk of the story has us connecting with the Republic Embassy on Manan to inquire as to the whereabouts of the star map. The ambassador agrees to point us in the right direction in exchange for a teeny tiny little favor, breaking into the Sith HQ on Manan to recover a droid's data module containing sensitive Republic intelligence that the Sith managed to steal via some clever bureaucratic maneuvering. That Clever bureaucratic maneuvering being that the data module ended up floating in the ocean and the Sith got the Selkaf to delay the Republic's recovery mission long enough for the Sith to steal it instead. Ooh, that's... wow, what an operation. I'm given a few ways to access the Sith base. I can decrypt some Sith pass cards, interrogate the Sith prisoner or break into the Sith hangar. Decrypting pass cards involves the solving of a logic puzzle, so that's obviously a hard pass for me. Breaking into the hangar is too noisy and obvious for my tastes, so I choose the most accessible one, interrogating the Sith prisoner. Now, since I've been conditioned by years of media to think of interrogations as 69D mental chess games, I was bracing myself for something along those lines. Sadly, all the interrogation boils down to is mashing through the dialogue options until the captured Sif spills his guts. That's such a stark contrast to how the situation is set up. You got this veteran intelligence officer who makes a big deal about how difficult Sith spies are to interrogate due to their conditioning and that it takes months of persistence to break one. Then he's like, oh, but since we're short on time, here's a truth serum to speed things up. But don't give him too much or his mind blanks. If you do that, you'll have to inject him with a neutralizer to reset his mind. But give him too much neutralizer and he might forget everything that he knows. I fucked up like 15 times and he never forgot a thing. Anyways, I grabbed the Info, make it to the Sith base, grab the data module, and brace myself for the 500 or so loading screens I'll have to go through on my way back to the Republic Embassy. Instead, I am placed under arrest by the Selkaf. So remember the whole we'll let you chill here as long as you play nice with each other thing? Turns out my breaking into the Sith base and murdering the entire staff runs contrary to that arrangement. Hey, it's not my fault the Sith saw from my flimsy disguise. I am assigned a lawyer who tries to defend me by saying that my presence in the Sif HQ was a case of wrong place at the wrong time. My lawyer even goes as far as to say that as a member of the Jedi Order, I would not have murdered so many out of spite. Mm -hmm. That goes poorly. It's worth mentioning that you're free to dismiss your lawyer and defend yourself at any point during the trial, an option I did not take because I'm just naive like that. Only when I saw my lawyer desperately pleading with the court to rule not guilty on account of my supposed mental incompetence did I fully realize the extent of his, well, incompetence. Remember kids, if your lawyer looks like this, you going to jail. Conveniently, you're given the option to present a data pad demonstrating that the Sith are planning to overthrow Manan's government as evidence right before the court is about to adjourn. I guess Bioware wasn't up to creating an entire jail subplot, just imagine how that would have looked. Trading cigarettes for cult of vials to treat your shank wounds, or vibro shank stab wounds. Where was I? Oh, the court drops the charges because of course it fucking does and I'm free to proceed with my task for the Republic. And yeah, in case you're wondering, no, the Republic hasn't lifted a finger to help me with this trial even though it was I who did their dirty work. And no, of course you can't bring up the subject of the Republic abandoning you to the convoluted Monanian justice system with the ambassador who gave you the task. Because why, why would you, right? So before proceeding with the story quest, we have a few loose ends to tie up on 
someone on. While this planet is quite thin in terms of side content, what it does provide is pretty high quality. Not just narrative wise, but also in how the side quests are connected to the main quest. The first side quest I picked up concerns a group of missing cell calf. Now, had I not sequence broken the quest, I would have discovered that they were coerced to join a secret SIF training program that would have involved inserting double agents into the Manan government and overthrow it. I didn't, so I killed them. Whoops. The second side quest concerns a trial involving a decorated Republic war hero called Sundry, accused of killing a young Sif officer. We are to investigate the circumstances of the murder and present the evidence to the court. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically the woman, also Sundry's mistress, was a triple agent. Sundry thought he was well on his way to turning the woman into a double agent, when in fact she was only pretending to be turned while actually acting as a double agent for the Sif. That's what a triple agent is, right? I'm, I'm genuinely asking, I feel dizzy just thinking of all these layers of spycraft. Anyways, after discovering that he'd been played, Sundry waited for the woman to fall asleep and killed her. So we just present the evidence to the court and let the justice system handle the rest, right? Well, not so fast. Because you see, this case can have some serious political ramifications. You may remember that the Republic is losing the war and needs the Colto to keep up with the Sith onslaught. Well, if Sundry is found guilty of murdering a Sith in cold blood, the Selkiev would be entirely within their right to ban the Republic from the planet and let the Sith have all the Kolto for themselves. So, on a logical, pragmatic level, if you don't want to cripple the Republic war effort, the right choice would be to omit certain pieces of evidence in court and present only the ones that point towards Sundry's innocence. On the other hand, Sundry got angry and killed a human being. A defenseless human being. Fuck, this is very complicated. No choice is the best choice here. The third and final side quest involves investigating the circumstances behind the Republic's aggressive recruitment campaign on Manan. We get an answer to this from the ambassador himself. In short, the Republic struck a deal with some moderate cell calf to build a base right on top of the planet's Kolto reserves. The quantity of Kolto the Republic extracts is just small enough as to not be noticeable. And it's a temporary solution until the genius scientific minds of the Republic find a way to synthesize it. As you may suspect, this deal is aggressively off the books and illegal. Which makes the Republic losing contact with the underwater base an especially awkward situation. We are to, you guessed it, travel to <laughs> station and find out what the hell happened while hoping to god the accidental awakening of an ancient Lovecraftian entity as not the source of the disturbance. And, uh, and and find the star map, of course. The underwater Colto mining thingy is where the game takes a sudden turn for the spooky. We find out from this panicked mercenary that the cell calf on the station have gone insane and started killing everyone. Some survivors manage to board the station submersible and leave, but if the explosion the mercenary overheard was any indication, the escapees might have become food for the big fucking shark that's been chilling near the station. Okay. Fuck, I hit my microphone. Looks like Lovecraft is on the menu, boys. So, our objective on station is to find an environmental suit for our underwater excursion and a sonic emitter. On my way, I fought Selkaf, destroyed the odd security droid, and stumbled into this dude who hid in a locker to avoid the massacre and refused to get out. Any lockpicking attempt results in an automatic failure because you can't actually get him out. He doesn't even have a model, so to speak. He's just a disembodied voice. Now, as for the station itself, I have to say it's one of my favorite locations in the game. Mainly due to the novelty factor of being locked up in a deep ocean mining station with dozens of insane fish people. It just feels so different. Miles away from the aggressively Star Wars-y we got Coruscant at home terrace and the Space Iowa that is Dantooine. Space Iowa because, uh... Dantooine is a farm planet. Mm -hmm. um, I hope my American viewers will appreciate that reference. <laughs> what nearly ruins this location is the seafloor exploration segments. No attacks, 
no force powers and by god your movement is so slow and clunky. So remember the sonic emitter we had to grab before heading out? Turns out it's quite a handy little tool for slaughtering Monan's shark population. Funnily, even though the sonic emitter presumably shares the same animation assets as the force powers, the character briefly assumes the melee idle animation after using it. Inside the Kolto extraction wing of the facility, I come across two scientists who theorize that a big fucking shark that's been chilling near the facility might have something to do with the cell calf going insane. Uh, how did he get so big? He ate a lot of Kolto. Alright, so we got an aggressive, submersible sized shark literally surrounded by the substance that made him so big. How the hell are we supposed to deal with the shark and reach the star map? We are given two options. We either reprogram the harvesting machine and cause it to explode, or put toxins in the harvesting machine and poison the water. The former renders the shark harmless, but would put the Republic's efforts to synthesize Kolto uh, a few, like, maybe 50 years behind? The latter results in the shark dying and the harvesting machine remaining intact, but also potentially in permanent ecological damage as they'd never tested the experimental toxin outside a controlled environment. I choose the former option because I, I respect the shark's hustle. If I were a shark and stumbled into a free source of life rejuvenating ocean juice, you can bet your ass I'd be all over that shit in seconds. I'd even go as far as to invent recipes. Colto carbonara, colto pane, colto bolognese, deep fried colto, colto tiramisu, colto cake, colto parmigiano, god fucking damn it I'm so hungry. So I do just that after solving a logic puzzle that I definitely didn't look up on the internet. The big shark is like, okay, go ahead. I get the coordinates from the star map, return to the surface and I'm arrested again. They go, what were you doing there? And I'm like, big shark. And they go, Holy fuck, that's like, that's like literally our god. Okay, you can go. Okay, time to hit the final planet. Is what I would have said had Sol, Carve's former mentor and the reason why he doesn't trust anyone, not sent a fleet to board us into his battleship. Yeah, it's the obligatory early 2000s prison level. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this section because aside from one notable story reveal, it's pretty bland. I had actually entirely forgotten about this level's existence and felt extremely annoyed at this detour. I just wanted to go to Koreban and Spelunk through sif tombs and shit. So it all starts with my party cooking up an escape plan, where the party member with the best chance to escape capture is left behind so that they can come later and rescue us. Karf, Bastela and I are out of the question because we're kinda sorta the main targets. So I chose Juhani for some reason I can't exactly explain. The plan works, the Sith barge into the Ebonhawk and drag the three of us to a dingy prison facility deep in the ship's bowels to be tortured and interrogated and potentially turned to the dark side. Sol informs us that Dantooine has been Alderaunt. Boy, this game sure has a knack for destroying tutorial planets, huh? And that Malak is on his way to interrogate us himself with the excruciating bolts of electricity we've been zapped with being just a little taste of what's to come once Malik arrives. Oh, and also... You're defiant. I'm certain Malak will find your loyalty to the Jedi amusing. The Dark Lord would probably reward me if I just killed you once and for all, but he may want to question you given the trouble you've caused him and the history between you. You mean... Oh, this can't be true, can it? You really don't know what's going on here, do you? Fucking what? Just, just tell me. What don't I know? Hey, come back here. Hey! Ah, fuck. Anyways, it's time to break these suckers out of jail, but not before I put like three or four levels of abilities on Juhani. Blah blah, Sith Troopers dead, blah blah, terminals hacked, blah blah, my party is broken out of jail. Our objective now is to head to the bridge and open the hangar bay to escape. Hey, so I'm absolutely stoked to be exposed to yet another 15 to 20 minute dungeon filled with trash mobs, but you know what would make this level even better? A spacewalking segment. Of course, Sol Karath and his posse of Sith goons and Jedi are on the bridge, ready to... what? Keep us busy until Malak arrives? I mean, surely he must know they don't stand a chance against us, right? 
Speaking of which, where the hell is Malik? Is he still in transit? Must be a big ship. Just when Karf is about to finish his old mentor off, Bastila is like, no, don't do it, it's not the Jedi way. And I, looking to preserve my max light side alignment for like stats reasons, go, yeah, no, don't, it's not the Jedi way. What the fuck are you talking about? We've just spent the last weeks murdering literally hundreds of people. So, with his dying breath, Sol calls Karf over to whisper one last secret into his ear which causes Karf to lash out at Bastila. Gee, I wonder what that secret may be. Alright, time to kill a few more Sith troopers and leave this. Oh, hey Malik. Sup, dude. Let me just skip past this scripted, non-winnable battle quickly and be on my way to... What do you mean, reunion? Tell me, why did the Jedi spare you? Is it vengeance you seek at this reunion? What? <laughs> you mean you don't know? <laughs> All this time and you still haven't figured it out. <laughs> I wonder how long you would have stayed blind to the truth. Surely some of what you once were must have surfaced by now. Even the combined power of the Jedi Council couldn't keep your true identity buried forever, could it? Yeah, I'm Revan. Boy, you cannot believe the velocity with which this twist flew over my head the first time I played this game. The twist was so wasted on 10 year old me. So here's what happened. The Jedi lured Malak and Revan into battle against a small Republic fleet. During the attack, a strike team of Jedi Knights boarded the ship. Instead of killing Revan, the Jedi strike team captured him, hauled his ass to Dantooine or whatever, and reprogrammed his brain into a loyal soldier of the Republic. If you're thinking, wow, that's fucked up, that's because it actually is. The Jedi, for all their teachings about peace and unity and the value of life, kidnapped and brainwashed a person of sound mind into thinking they're someone they're not. It's also an insanely stupidly convoluted scheme that can backfire at any moment. Like, what's stopping Revan from turning back to the dark side and using his brainwashing as anti-Jedi slash Republic propaganda? Did the Jedi Council have a contingency plan in case one of them turned to the dark side and informed Revan about their scheme? In fact, what's stopping Malak from, like, telling Revan he is not who he thinks he is. He didn't even have to do it personally, he could have just had one of his goons do it. Worst case scenario, it's just enough to plant the seed of doubt in Revan's mind and push him to confront the council. Just to be clear, I'm not bashing Bioware's writers here, rather the Jedi geniuses who concocted this harebrained scheme. The twist itself is actually pretty well executed. There's tons of hints alluding to your true identity going all the way back to the Ender Spire, where Trask was wondering how a new recruit such as yourself was assigned to the ship carrying literally the most powerful weapon in the Republic's arsenal. Bastila and her battle meditation. Then there's Bastila who's asking you questions about your past. She claims that she's asking to see if you're serious, when in fact she was checking if the false memories the Jedi Council planted were still there. Bastila claims that your shared visions about Revan are due to your force bond. That's only half true. Indeed, you do share a force bond, but there's also the fact that you were literally there because you're Revan. But the biggest hint the game gives players as to your true identity is on Kashyyyk, where the computer recognizes you. They really did drop a lot of freaking hints. Okay, so here's how this fight goes. Malak uses Force Freeze on my friends. When I get him low enough, he runs like a bitch to the next room. I take this opportunity to inject my ever-expanding collection of battle stimulants into my body. I follow Malak. When I get him low enough, a cutscene plays where he freezes me, and Bastila, now visibly on frozen, barges into the room for a needlessly heroic demonstration of courage to allow me and Karf to escape. Karf is like, Bastila no, and then we leave. 
cool. Back on the Ebon Hawk, everyone is kind of super fine with me being Revan? Mission is like, well what matters is who you are now. Jolie figured it out from the start, but chose not to tell me because to paraphrase, it's none of my business. Candorus is literally shitting and pissing and coming his pants at the prospect of having traveled and fought together with the guy who bested his people through sheer tactical genius and force. Even Carve's sorta okay with this. Yeah, sure, he's a little upset, but nothing unmanageable. So, all's well on the Ebon Hawk. Korriban is a fan favorite, and for good reason. It's this hostile, volcanic planet where evil people attend the evil Sith Academy in the hopes of becoming more evil. The evilest of evil. You couldn't have conceived a more cartoonishly evil layer if you'd copied it straight out of a James Bond villain's wishlist. So there's not a lot to this planet at first glance. I am greeted by a Zerka employee, because... Of course, the evil corporation had to have an outpost on the evil planet. I beat the shit out of some Sith and spent some time immersing myself into Caribbean culture, which mostly revolves around the Zerka outpost, its three corporate shops, and one cantina. I get a nice bit of story reactivity in the form of this Zerka drone lamenting the destruction of their Kashyyyk operation, which, as you may remember, my party had a direct hand in engineering. So my task is to get into the Sith Academy and infiltrate the Order by pretending I want to join it. Thing is, the guard won't let me enter the building even after I inform him that I'm Darth Revan. So we have to find another way in. We have to be sponsored, so to speak, by one of the masters. And luckily, one of them, Master Yutura, is chilling in the cantina at this very moment. Once in the Sith Academy, I am informed that in order to become a true Sith, I have to best the other candidates through cunning, strength, or any combination thereof. Back in my room, Master Yutura is like, I need you to help me kill my master so I can take his place, with you as my second in command. Lady, do you have any idea who I used to be? Well, I still am, but I used to be too. Anyways, she tells me that I have to be officially admitted into the Sith Order to access the tomb where the star map is. I clear out like three tombs, kill two of the students, redeem the other one, and the Sith Master is like, yeah, you can join us. Oh, and I also struck Darth Bandon down. I killed Malek's apprentice right next to the Sith Academy. For my final task, I am to travel to the tomb of Naga Shadow and access the star map. There I fought a few basic creatures, fought some non-basic ones, threw a cryogenic grenade into an acid pit, solved a logic puzzle that I definitely did not look up on the internet, and voila, the last of the star maps. The last item on our list is helping Yutura replace her master, but since I was merely committing heinous Sith acts in Minecraft and not like for real, I decide to turn against both of them. Apparently, there is the option to redeem Euphora after she betrays you like the good Sif she is, but honestly, I think I've paid my dues for all this playthrough. I think I am allowed to kill one perfectly redeemable Sif. As a treat. And dozens of other Sif in the Sif Academy. Force Wave is absolutely OP, by the way. Ball. With the final star map secured, it's time to press on to my final destination and tear that Malak guy a new one. At the Starforge, Karf sends out a signal to the Republic to come help out. A squadron of Sith fighters ambushes us, leading to another turret section. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about the turret sections, didn't I? Yeah, the game has turret sections. They suck. Then our stabilizers go down and Karf crash lands the ship on the only planet in the vicinity. A lush slice of tropical paradise called Rokata Prime. Apparently, the Sith were cunning enough to set up a field disruptor on Rokata to prevent enemy ships from getting too close to the Starforge. The planet is now a glorified graveyard which we are to scavenge for parts to repair the Ebon Hawk. We also need to destroy that field disruptor thingy before it turns the entire Republic fleet into scrap. Alright, disable the field disruptor, find salvage, repair the Ebon Hawk, and leave. Easy job, in and out, 10 minute stops, let's fucking go. <laughs> ah shit, this planet's gonna be a whole thing, isn't it? The first stretch of my stay on Rakata has me running into these natives which are technologically very primitive. They refer to me as the great warrior from the sky, ride freaking rank horse in battle 
and call the force magic. Though I have to say for a primitive race that shuns technology, they do seem to have a lot of these standard issue mass produced vibroblades. I know they scavenge shit, I'm just being an asshole about it. Not long after my encounter with the natives, I learned from the one that Revan had been here on some official Sith business back when he was in his joker face. Apparently Revan made a deal with the natives to slay their enemies in exchange for them helping bypass the barrier into the temple. Revan double crossed them and sought the knowledge from their enemies instead. So now it's time to hold our end of the bargain. Or not. So it turns out their enemies are more Rakata. As opposed to their barbaric counterparts, these Rakata, called the Elders, are smarter and more technologically advanced. Also, remember the Builders whose knowledge that insect-like robot was guarding on Dantooine? These are the Builders. Well, their ancestors were. The Rakatans we see now are what remains of the fallen empire that once sprawled the entire galaxy until they started killing each other with weapons of mass destruction. Deeply ashamed by the Starforge's destructive capabilities, their ancestors sealed the knowledge within the temple, ensuring that it doesn't fall in the wrong hands. Well, it did eventually fall in the wrong hands when Darkseid Revan conned the elders into giving him access to the temple, and now I'm back with the same request. A request which, understandably, they refuse to grant. Unless I prove that I've changed my ways by saving an elder that had been captured by the primitive Rokata. When I return to the one's enclave, the Rokata there attack me instantly. I have absolutely no idea how they caught word of my supposed betrayal so fast, but whatever. I save the kidnapped Rokata, bounce back to the elders, enter the temple, fight a fuck ton of dark jedis and robots, solve a logic puzzle whose solution I definitely did not look up on the internet, interface with the temple computer and get hit by a tsunami sized barrage of lore and exposition, go to the roof to disable the disruptor and uh, Bastila is a Sith now. Look, I totally understand where she's coming from with the jedi being arrogant and hypocritical and passive and whatever. The jedi teachings have proven again and again to be entirely disconnected from how human beings actually function. Just look at the countless examples of Jedis who cracked and went to the other side. I'm all for disbanding the stagnant Jedi Order and starting from scratch. But going to the dark side is not the way. You're just replacing one set of flawed teachings with another. This is actually one of my biggest problems with Star Wars. The utter lack of nuance with which it treats this light side dark side issue. I'm not the first nor the last person to express this frustration. It's why KOTOR 2 is so beloved, because it's one of the only pieces of Star Wars media that had the balls to like deconstruct all Jedi related things, point out their flaws and propose solutions. Eh, whatever, I'm rambling. Okay, so with that being said, let's let's get out. And here we are, ready to board the Starforge and strike my former apprentice down once and for all. Even with the coordinates secured and the field disruptor disabled, the odds are still stacked against the Republic because back Bastila's battle meditation is wreaking havoc on their fleet. To avoid taking further heavy losses, the top brass, meaning our boy Karf and this admiral that we haven't seen until now, decides to send an elite Jedi strike team on board the Starforge to do some Jedi spy fuckery I assume. Meanwhile, Malek's plan is to stall for time by hurling metric fucktons of battle droids, Sith troopers and dark Jedi in our direction while he's busy reaching his climactic bad guy villain final form. I assume. Now while many RPGs fizzle out towards the end, I have to say that as far as final missions are concerned, the Star Forge is pretty okay. By this point, you should have your party fully leveled and geared up and the enemies should pose no challenge. The Star Forge is basically a 20 to 30 minute victory lab where you just destroy everything in sight. I use my maxed out force wave to knock Dark Jedi on their asses, Jolie's force storm to burn Sith troopers to a crisp, Juhani's, uh, well, she's very strong. Wrong. She hits like a truck. I also copped some cool digs from a replicator. Too bad we're like five minutes from the credits rolling. I eventually come across Bastila who Malek left behind as a final stall tactic while he's, I don't know, doing hot Sith shit. She goes, true power lies in the dark side Revan, and then she proceeds to put my companions into stasis and Bastila Sean all over the place. It takes me about two seconds to get through her first phase and then another 5 for the second phase, which followed her second monologue about how cool the dark side is. The third and final phase is when Bastila snaps out of her Joker personality and sees the error of her ways. 
It's a... I don't know. Let's just say I remember this moment being deep and emotional, but it's actually pretty superficial. Like, most of my dialogue options are some variation of Remember the Jedi Code Bastila, or This is not the way of the Jedi Bastila, or The Dark Side is wicked and corrupted Bastila. Like, holy fuck, you'd think Revan, this legendary, larger than life figure who has experienced both sides firsthand, would have something deeper to say to his fallen girlfriend than BAD Bastila, BAD. Eh, whatever. So with Bastila redeemed and her battle meditation back to the Republic side, it's time to make our way to Malak and end him. We find Malak in a hallway flanked by two Jedi Knights who he'd been choking to death. He then pulls the corniest stunt ever by throwing his lightsaber at one Jedi and electrocuting the other. Was he like waiting for us to do this? He then goes, the Starforge fuels my power or something like that activates the most annoying combat puzzle in the game and runs like a bitch. Good thing I built my character as a hacker type because I can't imagine spending hours farming these droids for security spikes. Now, as for the final fight with Malak, it's a... Uh... Let's say that my experience with it has been mixed, historically speaking. So the gimmick is that every time you bring Malak close to death, he uses these comatose Jedi to regenerate his health. There are like 8 of these Jedi, and only 2 specific force powers can break the stasis tanks. If you don't have those powers, you're shit out of luck. Have fun fighting him 8 times. Luckily, I had throw lightsaber in my roster, so the climactic fight with the most powerful Sith in the galaxy turned into a space beneath hill skit that had me running around the battle arena and destroying the stasis tanks and then finishing Malak off in one go. I like to think Malak renounced the dark side in the last moments of his life, not because he saw the error of his ways or some weak shit like that, but out of embarrassment. So Malak's dead, the Starforge goes boom, and we all go to... Rokata Prime of all places. And that's Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. I don't have any thoughtful insights for the conclusion. But I will say this, I understand better than ever not only why this game is so beloved by the public, but why I fell in love with it. Back when I was a 10 year old kid in Eastern Europe with a newly purchased CD-ROM and too much free time on my hands. KOTOR is magical in a way that not even the movies feel. It's Star Wars, but with just enough of an edge to feel fresh. Ironically, in an era where the Disney Cinematic Industrial Complex owns the rights to Star Wars, KOTOR feels fresher than ever. Its setting, so far removed from that of the movies is brimming with potential for interesting stories. Its characters are nuanced and charming and so well written. The multitude of side quests with interesting stories and outcomes make this setting feel that much alive. There are so many things this game does right. I'm not a very nostalgic person, but replaying KOTOR as a nearly 30 year old adult gave me a sense of longing for a time when games were not only more willing to take creative risks, but also for a time in my life when I had the free time to turn them on all sides. I am rambling. Anyways, yeah, KOTOR, great game. I hope I did it justice with this monstrosity of a video and that you'll enjoy watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. Thanks for watching. As always, a huge thank you to my wonderful patrons whose generosity makes these videos possible. I'll see you next time.